Good day, viewers. I'm Mabelo Salabi, a legal trainee at Alem Solicitors. Here with me today is Inyolua Fatoki, a legal research assistant at Alem Solicitors. How are you, Inyolua? I'm doing very well. Thank you, You are welcome. Today, I have a few questions on telecommunication law. First, I have seen telecommunication towers here and there, everywhere in different locations or areas. Can you tell us the purposes they serve? Thank you, Mabelo. Now, these communication towers, alongside other equipment and devices, constitute what is known as a PTS, which is the base transfer station, and they can simply be referred to as base stations. Now, the, these base stations enable the electronic transmission of um, information across distances. So, these BTS they enable communication via um, wireless mobile devices. So, when a BTS is down, it will be impossible to make calls or receive calls on our mobile devices. Okay, thank you for that. Are you saying now that the telecom stores can be, are you saying that the telecom stores can be erected in anywhere without any factors to be considered? Oh definitely certain factors must be taken into consideration. Key of which is accessibility. No, for in the course of building the BTS and also afterwards for maintenance purposes, the location must be an easily accessible site. And also proximity to residential areas must be considered. Although the regulatory frameworks for the operation of the telecoms industries make certain provisions as regards proximity to residential areas, and I'm sure that we will cover that in the course of this interview. Also, the positioning of the land in question must not be such that it is um, located under high tension wires or cables. And then this um, piece of land must not be in a waterlogged area and must not be sloping. It has to be a vertical uh, you know, piece of land. And also, the future expansion of the area in question has to be considered um, in the case of urbanization or dualization of road by the government. We don't want um, a location where the BTS will be affected and will down the road in later years. Okay, and after all of these factors have been considered, the site engineers also have to carry out a number of tests, such as soil tests, and also ensure that a direct line of sight is gotten on the land, and then other tests that have to be conducted. Once these things are in place, then the process of site acquisition will begin. Thank you. Why is it that we see telecom towers um, with so many equipments, and some with just maybe one or two equipments? A BTS site may be a mono site or a colo site. Now, when it is a colo site, the um, process, the arrangement of colocation is in, is in place. Now, colocation is a common arrangement in the telecommunication industry. This is a situation where a particular tower, now in this case, a tower containing multiple devices and equipment, you know, houses several um, mobile network operators. Now, in this case, we can see a tower housing the equipment of MTN, equipment of Airtel, whereby a mono site just belongs to one telecommunications company and the only the equipment of that company is housed on it. Okay. Can you briefly state um, the regulatory bodies or agency that, that um, govern the telecommunications in Nigeria? Well, the NCC, which is the Nigerian Communications Commission, is the overarching agency in charge of regulating the telecommunications industry. And this commission was established by the Nigerian Communications Act of 2003, which we refer to as the NCA 2003. And then um, the NCC is empowered to make subsidiary legislation, such as guidelines and regulations and determinations carry out their functions in regulating this industry. And also we have complementary agencies whose um, function and role interlap with the operations of the communication industry. And so we have these um, agencies which also publish their own regulations to enable them um, oversee the operations of the communications industry. And these um, agencies include the National Environmental Standards and Regulations Enforcement Agency, which we refer to as NESRIA, and then the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority. Okay. You made mention earlier that the, there are um, subsidiary legislation that the NCC is empowered to publish. Can you tell us on the procedures prescribed by the law? Thank you. So section 70 of the NCA 2003 is, um, grants the power to the NCC to make these um, regulations, guidelines, and determinations. And section 71 of the NCA Act 2003 um, makes room for the process to be followed in publishing these regulations and guidelines. So in the case of the regulation, the Act mandates the NCC to hold a public inquiry before publishing a regulation. And upon the um, um, completion of this public inquiry, the findings from the inquiry must be taken into consideration before the publication of the regulation. But in the case of the guideline, the NCC holds the 
discretion as to whether or not to hold a public inquiry before the guidelines are published. But once they decide to hold a public inquiry, then they are mandated to take into consideration the findings from such public inquiry. Okay, thank you. Moving on, how come telecom subscribers on one network are able to call and speak to another telecom subscribers on another network, like ATEC calling MTN? How, how do they work? How, how do they make money and work together since they are competitors in that section, sector? Well, this um, arrangement is called the interconnection agreement or arrangement. Now, interconnection is um, a common practice in the telecommunications industry because, like you said, it is possible for a subscriber of MTN to call a subscriber of Airtel or Globe. So this um, interconnection is even regulated by law. Section 96 of the NCA 2003 and the Regulation 1 of, a tele of the Telecommunications Network Interconnection Regulation of 2007 provides um, that once a licensee, that is say MTN in this case, uh, receives a written request for interconnection from Airtel or Glow or any other network provider to interconnect, there is an obligation on MTN to interconnect with this network. That is the obligation to interconnect. Now you say how do they make money? This um, arrangement is governed by the interconnect agreement or interconnection agreement. And this uh, the NTC and the NTA at large gives the parties, a NTN and Glow for instance, you know, the, the opportunity to negotiate on their own terms. And when they cannot come to terms, then the NTC mediates in the um, coming together of their interconnection agreement. And in the course of this interconnect um, agreement, they agree on what is called interconnect charges or interconnection rates. Now, it is by this rates that they make their money. Now, um, Regulation 6 of the 2007 regulations I mentioned earlier provides for principles upon which these costs and charges must be agreed upon. There is the principle of transparency and cost orientation and, it, and the, the, this regulation also says that these charges must not be must be fair they must ensure that there is fair division of cost on both parties and also the charges must not include eating charges or eating costs that is our uh, HL should not pay for services that it is not um, enjoying from MTN and vice versa and so where this other way either party defaults on payment of interconnection charges now it, 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 it constitutes a ground for the um, disconnection of networks. But a party to an interconnect agreement cannot unilaterally decide to disconnect. And that is where the NCC comes in again, because the NCC has a guideline on the disconnection of networks. And this is called the procedures, the guidelines on the procedures for, the guideline on procedures for granting approval for the disconnection of networks 2012. Now, the NCC would look at the grounds that is being presented, which indebtedness in this case is one of those grounds. So where Airtel is, um, for instance, only interconnection rates, the, the NCC is always reluctant because of the effect on subscribers to grant total disconnection approval. So they would um, allow for partial disconnection. And the, uh, the effect of partial disconnection is that Airtel subscribers would not be able to call MTN subscribers, but MTN subscribers will still be able to place calls to and to airtel subscribers or receive calls from airtel subscribers but um the ntc also the nta rather also makes provision that any money arising from this um um partial disconnection where the ntn calls are still terminating on airtel networks then the profit arising from such um arrangements would now be used to offset airtel's debt to ntn so that is how they make money thank you thank you very much now moving on you made mention of NESRA as one of the regulatory body governing the telecommunication sector in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. What is the relevance of NESRA in the telecommunication in industry? Now, generally, NESRA is a federal um, federal government parastatal under the Ministry of Environment, Urban Development, and Housing. And you know, their so their overarching function is to ensure the safety and wellness and um, general welfare of the environment and to protect human health. And because the operations of the telecommunications industry affect the environment in no small ways, then it is it is not surprising to see Nigeria play certain roles in the telecommunication industry. Now, Section 34 of the Nigeria Establishment Act of 2000 and, um, of 2007 allowed the minister to make certain regulations and guidelines 
just as we have in the case of NTC, where the NTA allows them to make you know regulations and guidelines. So pursuant to this section 34, to the powers granted in section 34, the minister has rec um, published a 2011 regulation known as the National Environmental National Environment Standards for Telecommunications and Broadcasting Facilities Regulations 2011. We we'll just refer to them as National Regulation 2011. And you know, this regulation covers a number of issues as regards setbacks. Now, I mentioned proximity to residential areas the, um, at the other time. Now, this issue of setback is covered in the regulations providing for setback a distance, a minimum distance of 10 meters from the nearest demise property. And where 10 meters is not, um, you know, feasible, then 7.5 a minimum of 7.5 meters is an allowable distance, but others also subject to certain conditions such as approval from the NTC. And also, we have um, the regulation covers permissible noise level of generators because a BTS site contains at least two generating sets to power of the communication towers. Okay, thank you. Can you tell us the opportunities that are available for the future lawyers in the telecom industry? Where can they be useful? Uh, thank you very much. A telecommunications company would definitely have a legal department, and um, this legal department would then have certain units that you would almost um, find in almost every telecommunications company. Some of these units include the regulatory unit, the compliance unit, um, the community relations unit, you know, because these things are they are installed in community. You have to relate with the people living in this community. The landlord relations unit, the government relations unit, um, the real estate unit, um, the litigation unit, because in, in case um, disputes arise, then we have the commercial, corporate commercial unit, amongst other units that you can find in the legal department. Thank you. You made mention of various departments available for the future lawyers. Can you give an example? Now, the regulatory unit, let's take the regulatory unit for um, as our example. Now, I mentioned a number of regulation and regulatory instruments a while back. Now, the, the lawyers in the regulatory units have to function of ensuring that all of these regulations are strictly complied with because you know the breach of any would have strong liabilities on the company so they have the duty of ensuring that the company does not default in on any of these regulations and uh, basically just say that they have to ensure that every the telecommunications company where they serve crosses their eyes and dots their teeth in respect of the law okay in view of the general belief um can you, why is it that most people believe that the telecom um, towers are must uh, harmful to women's belief, women health? Well, like you said, general belief, it, it's not um, shocking that a lot of people believe that because, you know, when there is no knowledge, assumptions will thrive. But um, what, from what we know, based on scientific studies and public health researches, it is um, known that the communication towers do not really pose do not pose um, health risks to the human health. No, we have two kinds of radiation: the ionizing radiation and the non-ionizing radiation. Now, the ionizing radiation is the carcinogenic one, which causes cancer in human beings. While the non-ionizing radiation is not does not been proven to be harmful to human health, and the communication towers emit a, a low level. Um, non-ionizing radiation known as radio frequency and from research and studies it has shown that the exposure to radio frequency at the level that the communication tower emits them is not harmful to human health okay thank you are there any precautions prescribed by the law based on the telecom mast and towers of course there are precautions placed by the law that is the the essence of all these regulations in the first place but then specific regulations and guidelines also tailor these precautions and example of which is the guidelines on specific standards for deployment of infrastructure in telecommunication industry 2023 which is one of the NTC's guidelines and I've also mentioned the 2011 regulations of NESRIA so these um, two regulations in particular make provisions for precautions as regards setback you know, abandonment of towers, permissible noise level. Now let's take them one by one. For as regards location, again, I mentioned earlier that proximity to residential areas must be considered. Now these um, regulatory frameworks provide that when a communication tower is in excess of 25 meters height, it must not be sited in a residential re area without express approval from the NCC. So it's, you don't just, um, towers don't just appear in residential areas, they have been approved 
by the commission and also setbacks now there must be a setback distance of a minimum of 10 meters and where 10 meters is not feasible then 7.5 meters is allowable but then uh, you know you can't just go ahead and say oh, i can't find 10 meters then you can let me set back of 7.5 the commission has to approve they have to give their permission for you to use a 7.5 meter setback so that is that for the setback and because generators are used within bts of course they make noises and so the law also regulates the permissible noise level so once the generating set of the bts is um the noise is above what is permissible then the um owners of the towers are already committing an infraction and you know the law regulates for day and night and the day starts from 6 a.m to 10 p.m and then the night 10 p.m to 6 a.m now for residential areas permissible noise level is for 50 decibels during the day and then 35 during the night for areas um with schools and hospital you have 45 during the day and then you have 35 during the night and then for commercial areas you have 55 during the day and 45 during the night thank you okay before i leave you today can you do you also believe that the telecom mast and towers are dangerous are uh, injurious to human health well i think i answered this earlier but i would reiterate again that although what i believe is objective we are going to stick to known facts and you know evidence gotten from research and data that communication towers emit a low level um, of uh, a low level of radio frequency, which is a non-ionizing radiation, and as such, we can best assure that they do not constitute or pose any health risk to human health. Thank you so much, Niolua. It was truly really insightful to so have learned more about telecommunication law. Thank so, you to learn more about telecommunication law, you can reach us on our website. That's www.alemsolicitors.com. And you can also follow us and reach us on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Thank you so much and best wishes.